Okay, so can you hear me? Do I need to be standing near this, or can you hear me okay on the mic? Okay. Um, okay, so I guess I want to start off by the disclaimer that I'm not a computer scientist. Um, I think I learned Python uh, in the past year or two. So my background is as uh, in basic science, um, started off doing research. My undergrad degree was in physics. I decided I wanted to do something uh, more squishy, did biophysics, was really interested in basically how the brain works. Um, and uh, when I left grad school um, and came to my senses and realized I didn't want to get a faculty job, uh, which I'm allowed to say because my husband did stay. and it, does have a faculty job, so I know what a good choice I made. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I realized that I could do all the fun data analysis side stuff without do getting my hands dirty, um, harming uh, mice or stuffing grad students into functional magnetic resonance imagers. Um, and I realized all this data, actually, I mean, so uh, Tamara's talk on, on Quandles, like that was basically my dream that I felt like there's this case out there, there there's all this data um, that can be analyzed in, that's, that's the quant world, like you just get all the data for free. At the time, I didn't realize you actually have to pay a ton of money to get it. Um, but you know, you don't have to get your hands dirty, and that was a big attractant for me. So um, after grad school, I went and worked for a company called Starmine, which was based in San Francisco. Um, they basically did equity stock selection models. And so all my background in the quant space is uh, heavily biased in sort of the equity space. Uh, there's a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, but again, I come into this not, not as a computer scientist. Um, I think of myself as someone who writes code when I absolutely have to, to do something more efficient than uh, what I would do in, in Excel. Um, and uh, I'm going to give you, I've got sort of like a two-part talk. Um, I'm going to give you a little overview of what Quantopian is, just to give you guys some context. Um, and uh, then what I'm going to do is talk about what our, so, uh, um, just like there's going to be some good follow-ons from Tamara's talk, so uh, we're also interested in crowdsourcing. What I'm going to try to talk about today is basically what are uh, the, the crowd of people using Quantopian to write uh, Python algorithms to trade stocks. What are they doing? Um, what, what use are they making of our platform? So what is Quantopian? Um, it's an algorithmic investing platform. So we host data and we have a back tester to allow Anyone, so it's an interesting audience of a lot of folks that are, that are in the field. Um, our audience is just basically individual retail investors or really could be anyone. So anyone who wants access to uh, data and back testing to basically build a quant strategy and deploy it against their own account and trade stocks with it. Um, and for a lot of people who are in the industry, that sounds like a crazy and futile thing to even try to do. Um, I know I came from uh, most recently working at Thomson Reuters, <laughs> to admit that, but um, Coming from that background, I, uh, when I first talked to Quantopian, told them, you can't do this, there is nobody who fits that uh, Venn diagram of like wants to write Python, has money, wants to trade their own account, um, and there are. Like, so I was really proved wrong, and once they really proved me wrong, I was like, all right, now then I want to be on that team, because that sounds way more fun than what we're already doing. Um, so we're a platform, a community of quant scientists, hackers, um, collaborating to find investment ideas, basically. Um, also, follow on Tamara's presentation, we uh, fully support the don't charge anything model. <laughs> so we're a pre-revenue company. Um, we also have venture backing from Silicon Valley. And so all of our end-to-end uh, -end solution is free right now. Um, our model will be to eventually charge for live trading as a paid service, but uh, right now it's still free. Um, and we're powered by an open source Python backtester. So uh, Zipline is our uh, Python backtester. Um, you can go look at it, uh, contribute to it, fork that code, do whatever you want with it, uh, which lots of people uh, uh, do. On our hosted platform, we've run uh, over a million years of historical simulations on Quantopian. So we're, uh, we're really starting to see what happens at scale. Um, and we're becoming, I'm sure we're still really small, but I think uh, the Amazon clouds are, like, are still pretty happy to have us around running all these uh, simulations and paying them for, for access to, to their servers. Um, so what we've been doing lately, some of you guys, I see folks that I'm familiar with from our New York meetup series. So uh, what we've been doing lately, we're really interested in this idea of connect connecting people together in the community. Um, so we've actually just rolled out peer-to-peer -peer direct messaging. We have a lot of people on the platform who maybe they do use their real name, maybe their day job, they don't really want people to know who they are, they work at a fund, they're you know, doing this as a hobby. Um, and so in the past we've had people want to talk to each other and they can't figure out who they are. 
Um, so uh, as of last week, uh, if someone posts something in our forums and you think it's interesting, you can go to their profile and send them a message. And if they want to, they can email you back. Um, we started off with um, research data and basically creating like back testing framework. But uh, in January, we went into a public beta for actually um, connecting your algorithm against a real money account with interactive brokers. So you can go today and trade uh, real money with interactive brokers. Um, and if you want to sign up for that, you can. Uh, so if you want to use your paper account, literally anybody can do that. Like right now, you could go um, clone an algorithm and launch it against an IB demo account. If you want to trade it against real money account, we're trying to be a little more responsible and roll you on to doing that. So you, you need to get on a waiting list. Yeah? Uh, The algorithms are all by default proprietary. Um, and if you want to, you can publish them to our forums and share them. Um, so <laughs> same idea. You tell people this who are in the industry, and they say, no one will ever publish anything to your forums ever. And uh, it's interesting to see like, what people do publish and why. There's a range of motivations. They're obviously not publishing like, what they feel like is their alpha, um, but they're publishing a lot of interesting stuff. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today. Um, okay, so that's the sort of Quantopian overview. Now this is what I want to talk about, which is quant strategies from the crowd. This image fit better with the prior title that I had on here, which was more about like do-it-yourself quant strategies, but I just still wanted to leave it because I really am a big Jonah Hill fan. Um, so I'm going to talk about what, qu what quant strategies have we seen people in the crowd building on our platform. So right, we're casting, like there's a $0 price point. We're casting a really wide net. Like anyone who wants to um, can come onto our platform. Um, and if they can code in Python, they can write an algorithm um, and they can share it in the community. I can't talk about what people do on our platform when they don't share it, because like I said, that's proprietary. But I think it's interesting to talk about uh, what they do share. Um, so uh, what, do, what does a non-professional uh, need to build a profitable equity strategy? Um, this is just sort of a little bit of a like, let's get on the same page, like how we're thinking about uh, what people are doing. Um, so, and these are opinions uh, that I hold. <laughs> so what I think they should be doing, and they are not always doing this, is starting with an intuition. So um, you know, man on the street can have an intuition. Like I think that uh, this is a, a systematic way that the stock market works. I want to write an algorithm to describe it. We certainly have people who try to start with no intuition and just sort of like sort everything and find emergent properties. Um, again, my bias point of view is like start with an intuition. Um, and uh, if you want to use our platform, basically it's all about backtesting and assuming that to some degree what you backtest is going to be what happens in the live market and then forward testing that. So you need something that's reproducible. Um, now, this is a, another uh, good point following on Tamara's talk. You need access to data. So as an individual trying to trade a strategy, um, if your strategy is dependent on data that you either can't afford or can't get access to, or can't get access to um, in a timely fashion for when your alpha decay plays out, then you can't trade it, right? Um, so I think that actually, I, th I think this is one of the major limitations with what people are building on our platform today. And it's something we're interested in thinking about more about how to how to make that uh, cast a broader data net. Is the data, the data is free on your platform now? Right? So we provide uh, minute bar pricing data, mm -hmm. and then we provide a couple methods that I'll talk a little bit about to pull in your own data. Um, but right now, it's just pricing. So you can imagine that sort of like limits what what you can do natively. Trade 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 level pricing. So open, high, low, close, traded prices for each minute is what's on there. Yep, it's free. Yeah, I understand. Just equities, so we're just, uh, it's 2001, I think. OK. Uh, and lastly, um, execution and capacity, right? So if you're an individual, you're not sitting on a trading desk. Um, the types of strategies that will work for the amount of money that you want to put to work. And uh, you know, our platform is not a low latency platform. Um, our data, I'll show you our, um, our IDE and our uh, event handling method basically runs once per minute. So if you want to do a strategy, you're going to be able to place orders at most once per minute. They'll get sent to IB and they'll get executed within about a second, but you're not talking a low latency platform where it would be a great idea to try to do a scalping market making type of strategy. So that's on our education front. I'm just constantly trying to tell people like, don't worry about the latency because you're already you've already lost that game. If you want to play that latency game, go get a job at an HFT shop. Yeah, you've already lost that game. Go do something else or go work for an HFT shop. I'm just going to expect to 2001. Is that daily or minutely? Yep. Most 
It's just domestic US right now. It's like, yes, we, our database is something like six, 7,000 securities. Six, seven? ETFs, yep. Okay. Something like that. Yep. Are there any yeah, I think those are in there. I think those are in there, yeah. I'll show how you can do the um, SID lookup so you can look yourself and see what's in there. Um, No, um, it's whatever's in, so we buy our live pricing data from Nanex, so it's whatever all the US listed equities um, that are traded on the exchanges that Nanex provides. I, could, I can provide the link to what that pricing source is. So right now, because that's our core pricing source, that defines our universe, basically. Okay. Okay, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, we have so we have what I would call a pretty basic slippage model. We have got a couple, we've got a fixed slippage model and a volume share slippage model that we've implemented. It's all open source. So like sometimes people will come along and be like, "That's amazing! I can't believe you have anything." And other people are like, "That's totally JV! Like you should look at my slippage model." And what I say is like, "Great, write it and you know, put it on GitHub and we'll pull it in. Fantastic!" So it's pretty basic right now. Um, what I tell people to do if they want to really trade it with their IB account is use your IB demo account and then you're going to see what um, IB's modeling is going to show you and then trade it with a small amount of money and then like you'll get that data like very quickly and see. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, options. Um, we get asked a lot for FX options, um, futures. <laughs> Um, I think that we would love to do all of those things and we would love to make it global, so we would love to do everything. Um, I think the way we'll prioritize it is gonna be based on uh, two things which are not the same way of sorting the universe. So what people are asking for and what we think they will make money doing. Mm -hmm. So we specifically wanna be really transparent with profitability statistics and um, when I've looked uh, at retail level FX uh, and options and a lot of different stuff that people wanna do, like they just basically, it's like a casino. Um, and like, we're not interested in being the house that wins on high churn. We're interested in like building a platform where people can really understand what they're doing um, and have access to profitable strategies, which is not to say I think that that rules out options. Um, but I think when we do it, we need to do it in a really thoughtful way um, and try to also bring that education bar up and try to be able to help people implement strategies that, that you know, are reasonable. Um, so I will be shocked if we get to it this year, honestly. Um, but it's possible second half of the year options would come. I, personally, I think options, equity options would come before uh, like FX, I think, for like the view we, we have. So I wanted to talk, and we'll see in the interest of time, I can always skip through these, but I wanted to talk about uh, sort of five basic accessible quant strategies that I've seen implemented by the community members on Quantopian. So I know for some folks here that this is going to be at like a completely super simplistic level. Um, what I hope you'll get from this is that you'll see that this is something that um, everyday Joe Schmo, who happens to know Python and have an interactive brokers account, um, is doing on our platform. And uh, for each of them, I'm going to give you an example that has a link back to an algorithm. So if you're interested, uh, like right during the talk or after, you can go and look at examples of code for each of these and sort of see you know, what you think about people are doing, what people are doing, um, and look at it yourself and, and start playing with it. Uh, okay, so I guess I'll run through to give just quickly. So how I've categorized sort of five basic strategies I wanted to talk about were uh, you know, mean reversion. Uh, so the, uh, the price that something, so you've got like a, a price that a company is trading at and you know, you're understanding, okay, there's some random walk happening. Like I think the price is you know, still, the value of this company is still the same, $10 a share, suddenly it's trading at 12, like I think that's gonna come back down. So that's your view. You can turn that into a Python algorithm um, and trade it. Basically same kind of idea for momentum is just saying like, but you know, or it could keep going up because you know, everybody notices now uh, that it should be $10, it's $12, and they think that trend's gonna keep going. So um, a lot of basic quant strategies are built on basically the interplay um, and sort of tuning time horizons, right, of mean reversion and momentum. These are two really common strategies that people use on our platform because all the data that you need um, for these strategies is price data. 
Uh, so I'm going to talk about those. Valuation, uh, you know, bargain shopping, uh, buy low, sell high. Uh, sentiment, um, so there's this idea that, you know, if you can uh, tell what the market sentiment, whether it's through um, social media or I'm going to use a much more um, sort of, uh, sort of, conservative example, um, you can tell what people are feeling uh, about a stock, maybe you can predict its price. Um, and a seasonality is another really simple example. So I want to take a poll at this point. I've kind of given away probably how these sort out. Um, but uh, I'd like to check what you guys think are the most popular strategies among retail or individual quants. First two. The first two. Yep. Well, we'll see. You'll just have to wait till the end to see. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to use a really specific example. This is uh, a, a really common example that you see people trying to get at. I think a lot of why pairs trading is so popular is, I'm not sure, this is like a, a retail sort of focused uh, audience, but um, is anyone familiar with Ernie Chan? Raise your hand if you're familiar with Ernie Chan. Everyone on Quantopian apparently is familiar with Ernie Chan, and if you decide to post something and you want people to look at it, put in your title, Ernie Chan thinks that the strategy that I wrote is great, or I copied this word for word out of Ernie Chan's book, and like people love that. So anyway, um, what's the intuition behind a pair strategy? There's a good intuition, right? So find two assets um, that are linked to some the same underlying value. Um, and if you if you really think that basically these two assets are should be priced in some way where like they're both kind of representing you know the same value, um, you can just watch them and see when they're the market is valuing them differently, and your view is that they should be in lockstep, you can look at the spread, right? And you can do just you know really basic uh, you know rolling Z scores and say okay, I just want to check. And like every time the market gets out of step and actually values these two um, assets differently, I want to buy the spread or sell the spread and assume that the spread's going to collapse back down. So really, really simple intuition, which to me makes it a good candidate for you know, an individual sort of coding something up. Uh, the, the data that you need is just pricing data. So um, if you're doing this and you want to do it on like a daily strategy, that data is available through like Yahoo Finance or Google Finance. If you're doing it through Quantopian, you can use our minute level data. Um, so the data is pretty accessible. Um, the capacity, yeah, okay, well, that's definitely an issue with pairs trading. So you're talking about like two securities. So depending on what two securities you pick, you might have a pretty small capacity strategy. If you find what you think is an interesting pairs trade with like a profitable spread, and you try to put very much money against that, you know, very quickly you could you could collapse um, that trade. Um, so what are some common pitfalls? Um, I mean, uh, like, so just data mining. Like, so you tell someone about pairs trading, and the, I guarantee you the very first thing that any engineer or mathematician will say is like, okay, I get it. So let's write this thing that then scans every possible pairwise combination of every set of assets, and we don't care what they are at all, or if they're linked, we'll just find out like when this happens. And obviously, like that can work. You know, like that's a you know been a profitable thing at certain time scales. Um, but in the retail market, where you're not having any latency advantage, like the idea of really just sort of blindly data mining, I view it as like a common pitfall. So I try to encourage people like try to understand that you are finding two things that you know you think are linked uh, to the same the same underlying value. Um, Okay, so I, this is a sophisticated audience. I don't need to go through the simplistic examples here, but just you know, a, a graphic to give the idea of you know what you're doing basically is looking at the distribution of the spread between these two asset prices, and you're basically saying you know I want to uh, notice when the asset price spread comes into the tails of the distribution, and like by probability it's going to go back into the middle of the distribution. Um, so that's what I want to do. I want to buy the spread, sell the spread, and bet that these uh, the pricing between these two stocks is going to revert. Okay, so um, here's a, a nice example um, of a pairs trade um, that, oh, Peter, is Peter here? Okay, so uh, Huapu, whose American name that I use is Peter, is one of our New York meetup members. So he contributed this strategy, um, and it was one of our most viewed strategies. Um, so I thought this would be a good example. Uh, and let me hear. All right, we'll do it at the end if there's time. Uh, so what I wanted to do was jump out and show you the code for this algorithm. I'll leave that as an exercise for you to find on your own, or I'll see if I can get to it at the end. Um, but basically, this is an example of what a backtest looks like after you've coded up an example pairs trading strategy. So you know, just like I, I said, you're going to take these two stocks and, uh, and try to trade the spread between them. 
And so this is how the strategy has performed. Um, you can do some really basic stuff on our site that's um, sort of researchy. Mostly it's aimed at back testing and live trading, um, but you can create a custom plot. So here he's gone ahead and plotted a lot of the intermediate steps in defining the pairs trade. So you can look at what are your inputs in a model that you're putting together and plot those through time. Okay, so, so pairs trade is a really common example. Uh, and then uh, momentum trading. So intuition behind a momentum trade, right, is that you're going to look at, um, you're going to be looking for uh, what you think is, well, my view is looking for basically the behavioral bias of herding. So the idea being that um, when a, a stock or a sector or an industry is doing well, there's maybe some information really underlying, like why there's an appreciation of price in that area of the market. Um, and that information, even in the internet age, uh, that, that type of information um, and buying into that disseminates at like a much slower rate than you might think if you, you know, sort of subscribe to efficient market theory. Um, so this phenomenon is well documented. Of course, a lot of places it's, you know, uh, you, you do have high levels of efficiency and, and you know, you're not going to be able to make money off of this. But there are still corners of the market, um, especially if you can, can trade in small capacity strategies where, you know, momentum works. I mean, there's a reason it's still one of the main factors in, you know, a lot of quants, like large multi-factor models. Uh, so common pitfalls, <laughs> reversals can be devastating, especially when using leverage. I think that's the easiest way to say that. So how would you code this up uh, in Quantopian or in a Python method? So what I think is the simplest way to do it is really simple rules-based approach. Um, so one thing that you can do is basically rank a universe of stocks based on the returns price change over some prior horizon and say, great, I want to buy uh, the stocks that have had the most price appreciation in the last week, month, what have you. Um, I know the research group that I used to work with, we did a lot of stuff with um, multiple time horizons. So we would look across, you know, how efficacious is various trailing windows of momentum and we would create like a blended average of those. Um, and uh, there are some really, really simple examples of that that you can take a look at. Um, so here's one. So this is posted by another Quantopian member, um, and he's actually looking at, so another popular uh, celebrity on our site is Meb Faber. So also if you decide not to pimp your strategy with Ernie Chan's name, Mebane Faber is another really good one to use. Yeah. Yep, on our site. So we actually don't let you download the data. So the part of the way that we're able to deliver the service for free is that our deal with our initial data vendor and the deal that I am shopping to lots of other data vendors is we're not a redistributor of data, we're a redisplay for data. So you can't actually download our data the way you can the data from Quandle. Um, but you can basically run your back test um, and then live trade. There are still restrictions, um, given that you're running it on our servers. Um, those will probably change and um, will probably end up, when we eventually have some sort of a paid model, we'll probably like, allow you to pay for more server space. But right now, um, for bandwidth constraints, when we're running minute simulations, we limit you to selecting like a 100 SID universe, or sorry, stock universe. Um, and if you're running, we have a daily simulation mode, which you can use to basically try to get either like a larger breadth of stocks, a couple thousand stocks, maybe one or two thousand, um, if you're running over um, aggregated daily data. So yeah, we throttle that, which is mainly to control like our hosting costs. Um, there's no like technical reason that we have to do that. Can you yep. download the rank data at all? We don't, we make it really hard for you to pull anything off of the site, which is basically to try to assuage the concerns of our data vendors. Um, I think that uh, it's a very reasonable request to ask to be able to download stuff like your transactions and positions tables and those kind of things. Right now, you really can't do that in um, any convenient way, but I think once we solve the like security concerns that like let you parse what's your content that you created from the vendor content, then like we'll make that easier. Um, okay, so uh, what I'll do, 
I'll see at the end if I can hop out and show some examples in code, if I can get some IT support. But also, I'm going to publish these slides and share them with you guys so you'll have all the links to these example strategies. Um, you can go take a look at the code yourself. All right, so uh, valuation. Everyone loves a bargain. This is um, supposed to be Warren Buffett, I think, in this cartoon. Um, or they should lo love a bargain. I guess the idea is that not everyone realizes and appropriately values a bargain, otherwise this wouldn't work. Uh, but the idea is to basically use fundamental ratio analysis in a systematic way. So look at stocks that are trading at what you think are cheap multiples. Um, and try to find cheap stocks um, and buy them. Try to find expensive stocks and sell them. Perhaps exploit um, some differential sorting of, the, of that uh, using, using those metrics. So the problem with this type of strategy is that it requires good data coverage. So it requires data that we're not providing to our users um, out of the box right now. Uh, it requires, um, understanding. yeah, it requires understanding what you're doing. So um, it's easy to say, like, I'm going to look at PE, but if you actually want to be able to go and grab the PE or create the PE for a very, very large universe of stocks across multiple sectors, um, there's issues of normalizing that data. There's issues of knowing the fact that different companies report at different times and aligning um, that the PE you're looking at and comparing two stocks on is actually for the same calendarized time period. Lots of headaches of data. Um, manipulation and overhead there. So this is a little bit harder. Um, capacity, you're going to want to buy uh, lots of risky small cap stocks, which will look great until you get totally screwed. Um, and, uh, some, and, and my favorite also, yeah, some cheap stocks are cheap for a reason. Um, that one I really thought of when um, my friend was explaining to me that he reversed his Bitcoin arbitrage. And as on Mt. Gox, the price of Bitcoin started to go through the floor, they realized like this is the best deal on Bitcoins we're ever going to get. And they just like kept buying more and more and more Bitcoins right until the exchange froze. So that's not really an equity example, but there's the catch a falling knife added. Some stocks are cheap for a reason. Um, so how would you implement this? Um, it's reasonably straightforward if you decide to grab data from uh, Quandl, for example, and, and uh, this ex the example I'm going to show you does that. Um, so inside of Quantopian, we've got a method called Fetcher, which basically lets you grab CSV data from anywhere on the internet, so HTTP, HTTPS. Um, if you either create a CSV file of your own data and post it to like a public Dropbox folder, um, you can grab that. You can grab data straight from Quandl. So when Tamar showed the little like drop down, grab this data to Excel. They also have an awesome generate the API call for this data. Uh, and we've built a method that basically is wrapped around that. And they've been nice enough to share with us um, like a large authentication key so that users that want to basically directly plug Quandl data into our back tester can do that. We'd love to like keep making that easier and easier. Um, so anyway, you need to get that data. What, if, you've, if you've got the situation now where you've got you know, a comparable PE value across some universe of stocks, then you're now you you know most of the battle is won. You're going to rank that universe of stocks based on the PE, and you're going to decide that you want to buy or sell one one side of that distribution. Um, in practice, you know uh, quant models, uh, you know hedge funds or institutional shops are going to do really complicated versions of this, where they're looking at lots of different backward-looking ratios. They're also going to look at forward-looking estimates ratios, which that data is even more difficult to get a hold of and align properly. Um, and they're going to make lots of uh, sector-specific adjustments and add other bells and whistles. But at a simple level, if you have you know, a couple of fundamental ratios, you can sort a universe of stocks um, and surface some interesting ideas in a systematic way a lot faster than you would be able to do you know, one at a time uh, researching them. So this example, um, I hesitate to point you to because I just checked and I think we need to update our Quandl link. Um, but there's a great example that I'll make sure gets updated. And if I can show the code, we'll see if that'll work. Uh, you can grab like basically all the fundamental ratios from Quandl um, and pull them into Quantopian. And this is a really simple algorithm that uses like one ratio um, and sorts a very small universe of stocks, which is why it looks so awesome near the end here. It's just a couple of stocks. Um, so, so valuation is something that I think if we made the data easier to get at, we'd see a lot more of. But you are seeing people do this. Um, OK, so sentiment. The example that I want to use for sentiment is one that I worked on a lot in um, my past life as a researcher. So um, short sellers. Uh, the intuition of trying to look at um, shorted stocks as a sentiment indicator is basically that shorting stocks is 
hard and expensive and risky and not everybody is willing to do it. And the people who are willing to do it uh, better know what they're doing or they're not going to be around to do it tomorrow. Um, so we think of it as like the smart money, basically. Um, looking and seeing how much short interest or how many shares are short in publicly traded stocks is publicly available data. Um, you can find it, for example, on NASDAQ has a list of um, the short interest levels of all the stocks listed on their exchange. Um, so the example that I'm going to show, um, I think I scraped the NASDAQ site and grabbed like a, a static historical or a static snapshot of short interest across a universe of securities. Um, so this phenomenon is also you know, documented in the, in the literature. It's not like a revelation. Um, one of the constraints about the data that's available, so I said like you can find it, you can scrape it on NASDAQ, um, but it's not perfect. Um, the requirement is that the, this data is made available um, bi-monthly, so every two weeks. Um, the exchanges have to report the short interest level across all of the stocks that, they, that are listed on their exchange. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, they don't make it public for another five days or something like that. So not only do you have like a pretty low frequency snapshot of what's happening with the free publicly available data, it's, you're also lagged in time. Um, real time daily short interest data aggregated from brokers is available um, for a pretty big ticket price. I think it will keep coming down, but as you can imagine, like that's, um, that's valuable data. Um, capacity, the capacity can be small, of course, I guess it's kind of the same caveat for all these strategies, like it can be a small capacity strategy depending on what stocks you're trying to trade. Um, and of course, people that, that uh, are, so we built a model um, around this data set when um, I worked for a, a quant equity research firm, and as I would go and try to explain to people like, this is so awesome, you should totally follow what um, the smart money is doing, and we pitched this part of it. Uh, the biggest pushback we would get was like, that's great. So you want to put me in a lot of small cap, highly shorted stocks. You want me to short them. <laughs> and so what am I going to do when there's a short squeeze and there's like a liquidity constraint and all the shorts are trying to unwind their positions? Um, so that's a very valid concern and it's something that you want to be aware of. Um, one of the ways we tried to address that problem was we tried to basically um, overlay like a volatility type signal to try to look for are there stocks that are heavily shorted but basically are less risky. Um, we tried for a long time to find a short squeeze indicator, and I know like, if you could truly say you had found a good short squeeze indicator that was predictive, you could sell that for a lot of money because people are afraid, so, like, so afraid of getting caught in a short squeeze. We could not find anything better than historical volatility to basically predict future volatility. If anyone has a short squeeze indicator, you should post it on Tamers, on Quandle, and sell it because people would buy it. Okay, so um, how do you implement this? Basically, you rank the stocks in your universe um, based on, so I said there's a short interest level. You need to normalize this, right? Because different companies have different numbers of shares outstanding. So the way that people normally build uh, a sentiment signal on short interest is they take some normalized ratio. So maybe days to cover is a commonly used number. So take the number of shares that are held short um, and divide that by the average daily trade share volume. So you have some sense of the, the days to cover name means how many days of average daily trading would it take for all of the shorts to unwind their positions. Um, so if that number gets you know, higher, like both, there is a bit more bearish sentiment about that stock out there in the market, but also you know, um, by the same token, the risk of that stock having a squeeze potentially you could think of as going up because if suddenly something happens where um, you know, that stock is not a good short anymore, like they are a drug company and suddenly their drug does get approved by the FDA, but everybody thought it wasn't going to. You know, that'd be a great example of when having like a five day unwind of all the short positions could be uh, a very painful position to be in. Okay, so that's the signal that we're gonna use. Um, and so uh, this is an algorithm that actually um, I collaborated on with um, Foss, John Fawcett, the Quantopian founder, um, and we posted so basically, it has a, a static snapshot of data in it. It would be cool, actually, if someone would update this. Um, but it basically grabs historical days to cover for a universe of stocks and ranks them um, and uh, shorts the most shorted stocks and buys the least shorted stocks. So again, we've plotted um, what the turnover is, some, some uh, you know, intermediate steps in the, in the process that we wanted to look at. Um, and then all of these, by the way, that I'm showing right, of course, are, are posted and you can find them 
via these links, but they're also in our community page. So I guess I should point out, they all come with this little button in the upper right that says clone algorithm. So they're, all of these algorithms are open sourced um, and you can copy them. You can see you know, 379 people decided, I wanna copy this uh, days to cover algorithm and play around with it, modify it and use it, maybe use it. Okay, question, question on that one? Yeah? We don't have that in our, so we don't have that. Um, I would have to look at the IV demo account and see what they do. The borrow rates is really valuable data, and I think you get it like from the broker when you're trading, but I don't think that we can get it and like roll it up and build a model, at least not like easily. I think that that's like an area where that's basically that I would say is in your, um, is what you're going to get in your walk forward testing with like actually putting some small amounts of capital in there and seeing. I don't think we have, and they. It's probably worth us having that conversation with them again. So we have been like a little fly buzzing around the elephant that is IB, um, but we're actually starting to get some good traction and more and more people going and opening accounts with them saying, oh, I'm here because I want to trade with Quantopian. So they might be more willing to talk to us. Um, yeah, we don't have that right now. Right now, um, our slippage model, uh, basically we have like a volume share slippage model. And so it's really just basically driven by what does our historical like volume data look like? And so we say, okay, uh, you can never be more than 25% of the volume in any given minute or day. And then we penalize you and adjust the price like based on what, how much volume you are. So it doesn't have like, you know, it doesn't have that data. Is there another question? I'm sorry, but uh, for ID, ID question, can you execute uh, baskets long or short? No. So right now, um, we support um, market orders and limit orders. So all you can do is you and like one stock at a time. So IV has like, I don't even know how many different order methods and they have like pairs and baskets. So we don't have any of that yet. We have like the very simplest case. Um, you basically can say, I want to order, you know, Apple 100 shares um, and it will and it's a market order. It will go straight to IB and it will get filled. We use one execution algorithm right now, um, which is their smart order router, if you're familiar with execution through IB. We tried using something fancier and we caused more harm than good. So we start, we're starting off with sort of the simplest case. Yep, yep. So you can basically kind of create your own, you know, baskets, but it's not like it's executing as a basket through IB. You're not getting guaranteed that it's gonna get um, executed together or anything like that. But we have had lots of requests for lots of different order types. We, one that I really think we should do is we've had a lot of requests for, um, so if you have like a, you know, we have the structure set up where you could order every minute, um, but if you really want to be trading and rebalancing on like over the course of a day and all you want is like a view up over the day execution, we don't let, like we make you write the code to like, you know, execute the order. Yeah, it's like a little bit onerous right now. So I think that that one I would view as like highest on my list to add is like view up over the day. I think would would be like really helpful. Did you have a question? Yeah, I mean, when you said you have all this algorithm, um, I guess I mean, if you want to backtest your, um, you know, anything about your PML, yep. Can you use this as you know that you have any system that does that? You can see your PL. So this is this screenshot is doesn't show you the full backtest results panel. If I can get figure out how to get out of the presentation mode, I'll show you when you actually get backtest results, you have a bunch of different tabs with like your unrealized gains and losses, your transactions, and a bunch of other like the risk statistics broken out. So we have, you know, we have some amount of stuff. If we don't have what you want, click feedback and say, this is what I want. I don't think we have like a per trade like an average per trade p &L, which I think would be really nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so seasonality, I will just go blow through super, super quickly. Um, there are, like these are real popular on the internets. Um, so looking at, uh, are there calendar driven fund flows or seasonal things like uh, sell in May go away or January predicts the rest of the year. So is there simple stuff about the calendar um, that like is just, 
tied to uh, either structural things in the market or behavioral things that uh, just are persistent anomalies. Um, so th these, are, these are great to try because the data you need is just the pricing data plus a calendar. Um, and the capacity, of course, you know, if you actually think you find something uh, that's systematic with big you know, liquid securities, then you could have a, a good strategy. Um, the simplest example would be uh, just basically trying to, to use seasonality and time the market. Um, I like this one just because I think it's a, like people will ask me, like I would like to try playing around with um, algorithms on Quantopian, but I don't know how to get started. Maybe I know Python, maybe I don't. And this is like the simplest possible example that I think you can start with. Um, so this is an algo that I put up that just says, I think it was me, I don't know. Yeah, it is. Um, it just says uh, sell in May and go to bonds. And when you get to October, buy back into the stock market. And what's fun is it's like the simplest possible case type of thing, um, but you can get a feel of um, basically how you can write some simple systematic rules and look at performance through time. And people liked this one. Um, okay, so we reviewed those five basic strategies and I said I would show you um, what has been popular. So um, this is sort of the first slice of the type of analysis that I think is going to become really cool for us to do and then share, which is um, now that we've gotten you know, 17,000 quants, quasi-quants, scientists, hackers, aspirational uh, people in the field together, uh, we can start looking in aggregate at what they're interested in, what they're doing. Uh, we, we're not looking at the proprietary algorithms that they write, um, but once they're actually really doing lots of live trading, we'll be able to know in aggregate also how they're doing. So this is the first slice or first sort of view that I, I thought of taking on that, which is I basically just ran a query looking at every post that had ever been posted to Quantopian's forums. Um, and I ranked it, I ranked those posts three different ways. So um, how many times was there, or how many replies did the post generate? So what were there things that generated a lot of conversation on the conversation threads? Um, how many views did they get? So uh, was this something that, you know, maybe the people didn't talk about a lot, but, you know, quietly uh, we record every time the algorithm is viewed, so quietly just everyone's looking at it. Um, and then I looked at how many times was it cloned, or how many times did someone come to the site, find, you know, my, finds Ernie Chan's, you know, and implementation of a Paris trading strategy and say, yeah, I want to copy that code into my own account. So I ranked the universe uh, three different ways and then just created a simple combo rank um, and thought it was cool to look at what were the top 25 most shared algorithms of all time. And so from these, I called that sort of set of five kind of classic strategy types, um, which are the ones I called are highlighted here and then I added the valuation one. Um, so I think this one really, if someone can explain this to me, so the, um, there was a paper that was published by I think this guy Tony Cooper looking at uh, using Google search terms to predict market movements. And that's like been a pretty runaway success on our forums, even though if you go and look at the thread, like the thread is basically all about how it doesn't work and it's overfitted to like just a debt keyword at a certain specific historical time and like doesn't seem to have. So I really don't know why this has so much staying power. Like it goes away and then like someone will find it and surface a link to it or like tweet about it or do something and like everybody's back. I think basically just people really wish that Google search terms predicted market movements and this is like a, a view of that. I don't know. Um, but a lot of the other stuff in this top 25 list I think really is uh, pretty interesting content that surfaced. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Omar is something linear regression. What's someone in here must know? Okay, so it's like some like certain type of, of linear regression strategy. I forget what it exactly stands for. Online moving average reversal. That sounds right. So it's like an updating an updating mean reversion kind of thing, I think. People also love when you post stuff that has like long complicated acronym sounding things um, or like just really hard math terms. Like they, I don't know, that is extremely popular as opposed to just some simple like, this thing makes money and then I feel like nobody clicks on it. But if you're like, you don't know what these letters mean together, people are like, that is probably gold. I wanna look at that one. <laughs> I think, that's my interpretation. 
Was there another question? Oh, oh, yeah, your second part of your question. So uh, we don't have, I don't think we have enough data on real money trading to uh, get meaningful results of profitability yet. So, the, so on the back testing results, I haven't looked at that yet. I'm actually getting it cleared with our board that I'm allowed to do that. I think it should be fine. So we take really seriously, like as you can imagine, right? If you go and tell people, um, I want you to take your money printing algorithm and upload it to the internet, to a website where you have this password protected thing and we're gonna run it for you against the market and we promise we're not gonna steal it. Like you have to do a lot of work to build the trust um, that people will do that. So we take that extremely seriously. We take our security really seriously. We store all the algorithms um, encrypted and we don't look at them ourselves. We unencrypt them to run them against the market and then re-encrypt them. Um, and we have an internal system that logs anytime anyone ever goes into someone's algorithm and it has to be matched up to a request that someone submits where they have to click a link that says, I'm having trouble with my algorithm. I would like you to go look at it and debug it for me. So that's a long way of saying um, I haven't started looking at the aggregated performance data yet. Right now we have about a thousand algorithms that are running live in simulation. So we know that they're out of sample testing. They're an algorithm that someone has deployed against our simulation engine. So it's getting 15 minute delayed pricing coming in every day. I think that would be the first most interesting data set to look at that like actually has enough algorithms that there'd be something there. And then uh, you know, we're building out more data every day on what people's um, real money trading looks like. And my goal, you know, like I feel like we'll be successful if we can find people that can write profitable algorithms. So like for us, it's important that we can have some means of knowing that people are doing well to the best expectation we could have. And then I think if we can do that and in a way that doesn't violate privacy, we can communicate that back out to the public, I think that would be like really interesting to people and would be helpful. Yeah. To what extent is, is uh, on Pontopian like a social network? Um, there's, there's this new book out by Alex Bennett the MIT Media Lab, and then he uses an app with like managed trading desk called eToro, and he felt that the, the interaction among the among day traders uh, really drove profitability. Yeah, so um, our um, our seed funder, Spark Capital, is an investor in eToro. I think that's what it's called, something like that. Um, I don't know if it will drive profitability. I think that there is a very, um, there's a huge pent up, I think, demand among people in the quant finance world to actually like talk to each other and understand what people are doing and be able to say, okay, we're gonna keep our proprietary alpha secrets, but there's all this stuff that's commoditized you know, out there and uh, you know, we can actually do better as a community than we can staying completely siloed. So I don't know if it's gonna drive like people's individual algorithms profitability. I think it's going to be meaningful for um, how quants interact with the marketplace for their services in the long run. So I think uh, there's been like a trend um, to be more open and for quants to like actually capture more of the value that they create or that's sort of like part of our vision. And I think by giving them a platform that's not linked to their day job, that's open where they can talk with their peers, like that, that can potentially be a valuable thing. Um, and also it's certainly, a learning platform. So if you get folks that are coming in that are totally new to the field and then you have people that are experts that are for whatever reason willing, interested, happy um, to talk with them on our forums, then certainly for those people who are coming in who don't know that much, you know, their, their probability of success for sure is going to go up because they're going to see, you know, one thing I love is people will come on and we don't currently have a, a margin model like baked into our bag tester. So which, and if someone would like to write a margin model and just contribute it to our open source project, that'd be great. We're, we're, we're working on it, but it's not top yet. So what happens is people come to the site and they clone like a sample algorithm that we have that says, you know, buy Apple. And they set it up in some way that basically just buys Apple every single minute of every single day. And we don't stop them from doing that. So they are like, this looks amazing, guys. I found this strategy, which is like long Apple and it kills it because like it's just like free leverage for like five years following Apple going up. And what's great is like, so people will start and they'll make really common mistakes. And then like three other people will be like, oh, buddy, you know, you caught the like, you know, first rule of like, you know, go back and verify like that you're not trading more than you have. So seeing that people are able to learn from each other in this like safe environment without like hopefully starting off and putting real capital at risk. Um, I think that's another big part of the value. 
Um, OK, so here's the current breakout of how popular each of these classifications of strategies um, have been. Um, and so just like we thought, right? So uh, momentum and mean reversion are you know, the ones that we really have the data to drive. They're what's popular right now. What I'm really excited to see is how does this picture evolve over time as uh, hopefully we achieve our goals of adding more and more content to the platform that's accessible to retail investors' price points. So I'd imagine that if we can, uh, and actually you'll notice um, value's not even on here. So I put in that value screen thing with Quandle, but that did not make the top 25 most viewed algorithms. So what I'd love to see is, you know, as we get uh, more content that you see people starting to adopt like a broader spectrum of strategies. Um, and then of course, what's gonna be awesome is if we can um, show here like what is the universe of strategies and which ones are actually um, profitable at an individual level. I would be really excited to be able to um, come back and show those results. And I already said what's missing. Okay. Questions? Go ahead. Are the algorithms only in Python? Or they're only in Python. Um, so you can see what I'm doing now. Yay. All right. So right now they're not. There's like no way of sorting. So the community, this is what the community thread looks like. You see what is most recent and everything gets bumped down. Um, we have like a search capability. Um, so like if I want to type in Ernie Chan, there we go. Uh, so here you can see, like, here's the strategy. Or actually, this is a more recent version. This is a good one. Um, so here's a more recent version of that same pair trade that I was talking about. Um, so this guy, Aiden, who I then actually connected with on LinkedIn, and I think he lives in Australia and works for designing, like, um, autopilot and navigation software. I now am LinkedIn connected to at least five people who are um, autopilot navigation software or missile guidance. So if you need any expertise in missile guidance, I have like a new really core competency in my network of that. So anyway, here's an example, right? So I can search by name. I found an algorithm about Ernie Chan. Um, so Aiden's posted a post where he says like, oh, hey, I wrote this strategy. It's right from Ernie Chan's book. Here's a link to his book. There's a previous version. You can go to that here. Um, in this case, I used a Kalman filter. People love that uh, because it sounds mathy. So here I can go see his source code. So it's Python. Um, so really quickly, since I know I'm running out of time, but I did want to show you this. The way our backtester is set up is there's basically two uh, methods that you invoke. So you can import any library that we've whitelisted. If we haven't whitelisted it, you can ask for it. If it's a library that has hidden in it something that says, like, open all your source documents and email all your data out to me, like, we will not whitelist that. That's mostly what we get asked for, <laughs> like, somehow. But anyway, if we don't have it, we'll try to whitelist it. We do a lot of stuff with pandas, um, NumPy, SciPy, et cetera. So there's an initialize method that gets run once at the beginning of the backtest or once per day if it's a live trading algorithm. So here you can do stuff like say uh, what stocks you want in your universe. So we have our own security identifier um, and I'll clone this algorithm so I can show you how that works and how you add. So if you go to the forum and you copy somebody's algorithm, you get brought to our IDE. So you get this um, window where you can start writing Python code. Let's say that you wanted to try some different stocks. Um, so like you can basically um, go in and start to add another stock that you might want to look at. So we have um, our SID method lets you look up um, stocks by their name. So like let's say I wanted to look for Facebook. So we have an auto lookup that lets you start typing the name of the stock and it will find our security identifier that we use. So you can add securities to your universe here. Um, this is where I mentioned there's uh, methods for sl setting a slippage model and a commission model. They're zeroed out here, but you can put in, if you know your commission structure, you can put a fixed commission per trade. Um, is that better? There you go. Okay. Um, okay, so then, so the initialize method gets run once, then this handle data method right here, which goes a little bit on below the page, this gets run every minute. So if you want to run a strategy um, that just needs to execute like at 931 or one certain hour of the day, you just basically put a wrapper in this that says, if it's not the time I want to trade, pass. But this handle data method gets run once per minute. So at most, you can do something once per minute, submit orders to the market once per minute. Um, so this is basically what you have access to. Um, the only UI settings are over here. So you decide, like, I want to run a back test from what date to what date. What's my initial capital base going to be? Do I want to run this as a minute simulation, or do I want to use the daily back of the envelope simulation? Um, and then uh, you can 
uh, run a build on that. Oh, and I did it for dates that are in reverse order. We'll see if it builds. So you can build it and you can back test it. That's telling me that I added a stock that doesn't have a date range that's overlapping with the other stocks. Um, so let me really quickly go and see. I thought there was like one other example that I wanted to show. Uh, well, let's just go look here. What I oh yeah, I know. Okay, since I have this browser open, there's one last thing I want to show. This will take a second to update. So, still with all the like research stuff, what people really care about and are interested about is that they can write an algorithm that they then deploy against their own interactive brokers account. Um, so this is my super simple test algorithm that's deployed against my interactive brokers account. Um, when you open up a live trading algorithm, the plots update like through history. So you get to enjoy um, the painful early drawdown that my strategy had in the first few days when I really almost turned it off. I was like, oh, it's just tracking the market, but I just can't take this, this downside of like the first week of February. So what you're seeing here is um, if the window fits, so here's what you get in your live trading dashboard. You get uh, a performance, like equity curve, basically, your algo's performance in blue against the benchmark in red. Um, you get to see what positions you hold. So I have a strategy that just buys equal weighted of nine sector ETFs, and I want it to be sort of testing that trading's working. So every single day, it's actually checking, is it still equal weighted across these nine sector ETFs? And if it's not, it's placing trades. So I can see right here my current positions, like as it updates through time. Um, and then I can see down here, what orders and fills have I placed? So when I launched this strategy on January 24th, you can see I placed a bunch of market orders for these nine sector ETFs. They don't move that often. They don't need to be rebalanced every single day. I'm doing that. So you see, OK, every day, like maybe I'm at most like a share or two out of line with one of these, and I place those orders. Um, so when I look at this, like right, I can go back and say, what was the source code that's that is under the hood in this algorithm that's deployed against the market? So I can go and see that source code. Um, and I have an ability to uh, log information out to myself. I think this one just tells when it rebalances, so nothing particularly exciting. Yeah? You can't. That's another really commonly requested. So the benchmark is just uh, the returns to SPY right now. Um, we have a long list of API feature enhancements, and that's like pretty high up the list. But right now, you can't do that. Yeah, and I think I have time for like uh, one more question, maybe. Okay, go ahead. Do you um, a history of the constituents of any of the indices that I could say in my back test I want it to be whatever it's in the SP We don't right now, and that's like a data licensing thing. So right now, the only way that we let you um, select a broad swath of stocks in like an unbiased way, we have um, a daily dollar volume universe that we compute. So you can use, uh, a, it's called like set universe, and you can ask for some tranche of stocks based on liquidity. And we update that universe quarterly. Um, I've been looking at, so I've been looking at lots of diff, like data shopping.